This is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to the Whole Horse Podcast. I'm coming to you from the Cowichan Valley on beautiful Vancouver Island in Canada, and I'm excited to be bringing amazing instructors from around the world to share their knowledge about all the ways that we can keep ourselves and our horses well and happy, and about some of the cutting edge techniques, training, and different aspects that are coming into the horse industry and changing it from within. I'm so excited you're here, and I'm excited about the times that we live in and the shifts that are happening in the horse industry before our eyes. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. It's Alexa Linton here, and you're on the Whole Horse Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Emily Kisson. She's a researcher and does outreach education. And I saw a post uh, of her work on Facebook and I was absolutely fascinated. I, had, I knew I had to reach out and see if I could get her on the podcast. And I'm so grateful that you said yes, Emily. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You are so welcome. Um, I can't wait for this conversation. We've just had a little chat before the call, and and I know we've got so much to share. Emily, will you share just a little bit about about you, about some of the amazing work that you're up to right now, particularly as it pertains to horses? Yeah. So I've um, I've been involved with horses most of my life. I've been full time pretty much for the last twenty years. The last 10 years have been focused more on equine assisted psychotherapy and equine assisted activities and therapy, really looking at the horse human interaction, both physically and psychologically. I got honestly a bit frustrated early on because I couldn't see where the science was, I couldn't see where the research was, and I really got um, frustrated with the inconsistencies in how people were trying to explain things. And so I decided to go back to school and I got a graduate degree in uh, equine science. I finished up a master's in psychology. I'm currently finishing up my doctorate in comparative psychology and um, have paired up with lots of people all over to do research on horse human interactions, really to look at what that means under a lot of different contexts, whether it be equitation, horse human interactions with people in their own backyard, and especially equine assisted psychotherapy. Mm. Um, we use, I mean, we, we use, we, I, and I use the term use um, very specifically, uh, horses in therapy um, to help people with interpersonal relationships and to really get at those interpersonal relationship skills, connecting, trust, all of that, except that we don't have enough information from the horse perspective to really know what that looks like for horse-human interactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I decided that I couldn't find the research that I was looking for, so I would start doing it myself. (laughs) I've managed to collect a lot of amazing people on this process, and so I have, you know, great co-workers, colleagues, Mm. collaborators from all over the world, and we're kind of working together to parcel this and and, and put together the puzzle pieces that will hopefully start making a much clearer picture for all of us to make for this. Fantastic, yes. And uh, I know that, you know, I have also been involved in sort of the, the equine psychotherapy, equine facilitated learning, and and yeah, I've seen that, that gap in, in terms of, you know, there's an assumption that the horses are good with it and the horses are yeah. partaking and the horses are healthy within that. But there's, a, you know, like you say, there's not kind of a bottom line in terms of research, you know, what are, what's actually happening in their physiology in those moments. So that's fantastic that you're doing that work. Yes. Awesome. I'm so excited to talk more. So Tell us a little bit about the the current work that you're up to. Um, so you're, I believe, in Oklahoma. Correct. Correct. Okay. And um, so this work within uh, the, the large, large herds there uh, was the thing that really, I, I saw this post on, on, on Facebook. I was 
like, yes, oh, you know, it resonated so deeply around uh, how herds actually respond and react mm-hmm. um, outside of, you know, kind of what, what I think in North America has become our particular thinking around, oh, they dominate each other or there's, you know, it's totally normal to have like, you know, it's totally fine as a trainer to be aggressive or be this, you know, I think we've sort of used it as a bit of a, a, a crutch for being, you know, really not that nuanced or, or, or nice to our horses. So, so yeah. what have you noticed in, in your work uh, with these large herds? Okay. So I have access right now. I have access to about 700 horses. Wow. Yeah. Um, there, there are three different facilities. Two of those facilities are breeding facilities. So they're primarily mares are the, and the other one yep. is a rescue facility. So that's a combination of mares and geldings. Obviously the rescue facility has, you know, the horses there have a wide range of breeds and backgrounds and histories mm-hmm. where the horses at these breeding facilities, a lot of them have been together for years. They have this, they're the same breed. They're the same background. They're, you know, they have these very homogenous histories and a lot of them have very tight, close connections with one another because they've been together for a long time. So it's a very, it's an interesting sort of scenario where I have, you know, a hundred horses at the, at the rescue facility with varied backgrounds, varied breed, varied ages, different genders, and then the breeding facilities where there's a couple hundred and you know, they all have a very common background. But so what I'm looking at um, specifically is yeah. looking at how horses create and maintain friendships and what their what that kind of community looks like in these larger herds. And I wanted to look at these larger herds is because we we in the equitation community, most people think of horse facilities as lots of stalls, a lot of individual paddocks. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not necessarily how horses would naturally be. And so I'm trying to get at, okay, when they are in these larger herds that, while it's still not the same as if, you know, the, the feral herds or the wild horses, um, uh, it's, it looks at a much more natural dynamic when they all have the ability to graze and to choose their yeah. partner and to choose who they want to be around and and what that looks like when they all have this space together um, and they're not super confined and so I go out and I have I have a lot of cameras with me Um, I spend I got up to 10 hours a day at some of these places wow and um, I was lucky enough the post you were you mentioned was I was lucky enough that I way overestimated the number of cameras that I needed to set up and the amount of time I needed so I ended up sitting next to a tree and just watching them and I'll always go out and watch them. I'll, you know, I'll set up the cameras, but I'll always be there watching because it's so critical to just look at those tiny subtleties that they, yeah. how they communicate with one another. And we so often in the equitation community don't have time to do that. We don't have, we, yeah. we often don't have time to sit and watch or even recognize those tiny little signals that they give one another as part of their incredibly complex communication system Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah and so um i was out there and i come from that traditional you know horse background where yes but like you said the okay you have to you walk into that pasture you're the dominant horse you know who's you're the you're the leader of that herd you're going to be the um you know you have to be the one to tell everybody else what to do um I don't see that at all. I haven't seen that for years, but especially in these large herds, um, there is no sign of hierarchy. Um, And even in the literature, when we get into looking at the definitions of hierarchy and dominance in the scientific literature, the, you know, hierarchy is a very specific kind of system um, that is not at all applicable to what I see in horses and the dominant submission sort of thing um, especially in literature is looked at under pairs of horses when resources are scarce and so they're looking at who's bullying who right Um, which again not what occurs in their natural systems and 
Uh, and it's and it's really interesting reading the literature on this because in order for them to figure out who's dominant over who, they have to take them away from whatever environment they're in and stick them in this little space. With and little then, food, like, probably. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they have to fight over what's yes, there. Yes, exactly. It's mm -hmm. creating that. It's like, okay, you're going to get that no matter who you have in there. Absolutely. And, you could put two people in there and, you yep. know, yeah, put a cheeseburger in the middle and you definitely have a fight on your hands. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and what a, what a, sh you know, imperative shift in, uh, you know, in terms of changing this, you know, kind of longstanding narrative in our, in our horse industry, you know, of this, you got to get in there. You got to, you got to be the boss. You got to show them, show them who's, who's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah. So what do you see instead of that? Um, a lot of, okay. So they, um, again, this is the groups that I, I'm, I'm studying right now. These herds, I am about to um, head off and study some other herds in different places and hopefully start collecting even more data from all over the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see pairs of horses, mostly, mostly pairs, sometimes threes, um, and sometimes those pairs group up with other pairs. So there's sometimes there's groups of four. So it's usually two to four horses and these little kind of clicks. <laughs> mm -hmm, Some mm -hmm. of them um, are much more, I guess you could say, attached to one another than others. But they always maintain visual contact with one another. They typically don't let anybody get between them. So they're very sort of closely connected friendships. If you want to call it, like I'm defining yep. friendships very loosely here. Yeah. And um and they protect that space. They each have their own space and they determine who they want in that space. And, and within that, you'll get courses that are much more protective of their space than others. Um, so they may, those might be the ones that pin their ears more often or um, mm -hmm. seem maybe labeled as more dominant or aggressive, but they're not, but the dominance and the, the the hierarchy part of things and the dominance part of things often comes over comes from a control of resources. Yes. And so, and so there's no, there's no indication that any of these horses are controlling resources. Horses are grazers. They're herbivores. They have resources everywhere. And so they yeah. can, they can determine who they want in their own personal space. Um, and so that's all I see is that some horses mm. are much more what you might call verbal or outspoken about absolutely um, while others are more just sort of okay I'll go over here instead and it's not a it's not so much a dominant submissive or a hierarchy thing as much as it is a okay I'm setting my boundaries very clear and others are less you know concerned about where those boundaries are absolutely Hmm. Um, and, and so with other resources, so say water, does mm -hmm. that dynamic change? Nope. I've seen the same. It's, it's that I, it's interesting because you'll see horses sharing space, obviously, um, with, you know, food or water and they'll, but only once did I see one horse, what she, you might, if, if I took it out of context, I might say that she was defending or um, being possessive of the water resource. Really, she was just standing next to the water. That's where she planted herself. And she didn't want anybody in that space. She <laughs> yes. walked, then at one point she walked five feet away from the water and stood somewhere else. And then it was, and then, and again, her little bubble, that was her space, um, was still around her, but other horses went and got drinks. So it's, less of a control of resources and what seems to be much more of a, of, of this is my space and this is who I want in my space. And, yep. um, and it's, what's really interesting about this all is that, um, you know, we, you just mentioned the, you know, we use, we've used that, that dominance thing in our way of communicating with horses for so long and our understanding of it for so long that it's almost helps us justify the tools that we do have. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and all of, and most of those tools that we have are all based on our history of horses using them as tools for 
transportation or work or warfare or whatever it is. And it was really about us manipulating their behaviors. Yes. And so, and so all the tools that we have to use under those circumstances are all based on the context of horses in history. And it's all based on, um, you know, if we look at learning theory, it's all based on negative reinforcement, mean, yeah. meaning pressure and release, that, that giving of a small aversive stimulus and then taking it away once the behavior we want is exhibited. And so it's, a, it's us giving this aversive pressure and then taking it away when that, when that behavior is exhibited. Yes. That doesn't occur in their normal environment. Like that doesn't occur between horses. So if we really want to look at how we're trying to communicate with horses and bond with horses or create that emotional connection that happens from both sides, we need to reinvent how we're interacting. Yeah. <laughs> Big, time. <laughs> Big time. So, you know, in terms of, of your work, I know this is still a part of, you know, is, is creating that, that bridge into like, okay, how does this, how does this live within the equitation world, within mm -hmm. the equine industry? Ha, has that, have any kind of ahas, you know, filtered through or, you know, have you seen any ways that this can, this, these things that you're learning can be, be, um, yeah, taken into horse rider connections and the ways that we are with horses. Yeah. I think that honestly we need to, well, first we need more patience and I say mm. that. Because, mm. um, yes. Most, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, yeah. We need, uh, I, it's, it's one of those things like we, you know, most, and I, and I am generalizing here, but there's a huge number of people who get into, you know, working with horses and they want the horse, they want a goal. They're very goal oriented. Yeah. Um, and or they have an agenda or you know they're going to go out they're going to get their horse they're going to go in the arena they're going to do this um and that whole idea of creating this relationship is almost somewhere else like it's not even part of that program no and um but if we start to actually learn how to listen to our horses and create a better communication system really understand what their behaviors mean as opposed to what we've been interpreting or what we've been told to interpret for so long um again i come from that background of oh your horse does this it means this or yeah your horse is acting up or your horse is misbehaving and it's really like okay no my, my horse is actually really communicating and so what is he or she actually saying and or and why is yes the horse saying that so you know, they, um, so, you know, at the very basic, you know, having that patience of being able to establish that communication, that two-way communication, but also recognizing that the tools we have aren't matching necessarily what we always want to be doing. And yeah. when I'm watching horses create relationships with one another and maintain these relationships over time, everything is mutual it's not one-sided and it's not punished. So um, this pinning of the ears thing, what's really fascinating is that, yeah, you'll have affiliates that will pin their ears at one another, not in the aggressive way that we're used to saying, oh, your, your ears are pinned or they're not, but it's a very subtle way of saying, okay, I don't want you over here right now. Um, yeah. And a lot of the time that's not because they don't want that horse in their space. It's a lot of times it's protecting the other horse from whatever they're, I mean, again, that's, that's me projecting a little bit, but it seems yeah. to be more of a, you know, you have one horse that's a little bit more curious, a little bit more confident than the other. And the one that's stand, standing off a little bit will approach and that the one that's more curious will sort of turn his or her head, print her ears a little bit, but not in an aggressive kind of way. It just means like, stay yeah. there. Yeah. Like, I'm not finished checking this out yet. Yeah. And then, and then usually a few minutes will go by and then the other horse will kind of come up. And it, so it's not, um, not in a dominant kind of way, but more of a, it's, it's a very, they do lots of different behaviors that are more hmm. indicator of, of protective of their friends yep. than, um, than anything else. But, Beautiful. Um, but the two way mutual thing is really what gets me because again, everything, mo everything, again, I'm generalizing. Um, a lot of what we have 
in terms of the tools that we used to work with horses is very one sided. And Makes if we're sense. looking to create those affiliations with our horses in a way that they understand and they can actually, you know, be a part of everything is grooming is mutual. It doesn't happen as often as we think it does. And it only happens between affiliates. They don't actually groom each other very often, but you know, we, we think of horses as liking to be groomed, but they may need to groom us back in order for it to really be effective in yeah. terms of bonding yeah. and um, movement. It's never one sided. It's always together. Everything is a pair mm, you yes. know, approaching things. It's, mutual engagement in you know curiosity and uh exploration and it's no, no one's ever making anybody else do anything it's always a mutual decision together we're going to do this together it's your decision as much as mine yes let's, let's go and do this together yeah and and it sounds like there's you know um yeah this sense of like almost you know not to anthropomorphize Besides, but sort of a concern that that comes in like in a good in a healthy way, you mm -hmm. know, like say I know in in some of these different horsemanship styles, it's like you get your horse over that thing that they're scared of, or else you know I, I grew up in yeah. a very like what I call get it done horsemanship yeah. style yes. you know as a as a kid and and I remember specifically you know I was terrified of my instructor um and, they, and therefore, I, you know, did a lot of things that I'm not proud of to my horse, uh, the horse that I was working with at the time, because I, I was terrified. And I, you know, I, I, you know, that's a part of it. But then I sort of perpetrated that on, onto this poor animal who was also terrified and had showed yeah. it, you know, maybe by refusing a jump or, you yeah. know, going, I'm really freaked out, man. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't get this. And then having this instructor just being like, get it done. And then yes. I'm like, ah, you know, caught between this rock and a hard place of like, you know, I don't know what to do here. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking in our industry. It is to see how normalized abusive behavior is towards horses, um, first of all, so harmful behaviors. And, and, um, and I, you know, to hear this is so heartening for me, you know, that, cause this is what I see even in my relationship with Diva and is this sense, like even this morning we were working, uh, cause she just, needs to be working out every morning right now she's on a uh you know a little bit of a grass field she's <laughs> she needs, <laughs> we need to we need to move it out in the mornings um and she just enjoys it so much more when i'm moving with her yes when i'm not like standing in the middle of a round pen and like go you know yes. she's like she's like come on now yeah. like we're both working out here let's do <laughs> yes, yeah it's, and yeah like that's it's, again if you're really you know, it can be, I'm sure it's probably confusing. Again, I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit. Um, it's like, okay, if we're together in this, why are you in the middle and I'm out here? Completely. And you're just standing there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not even like facing me at certain points. I know that, <laughs> you know, they must be like, what is going on? What are you doing? Oh. Um, yeah. So I, I love that, you know, it, it, you're starting to go, okay, this is where we can, we can tie this in. Like, you know, at the beginning of the call, you said, yeah, a lot of people just don't have the time to, to sit with their horses. But I would, I would argue that a lot of people don't take the time. I completely agree with you. Yeah. And I would also argue that that is an essential component of all it of this. It is absolutely essential. And, you know, I would, I would say to all our listeners out there, how many of you have just sat in the paddock, took your chair <laughs> in, took a book, or just like hung out and like hung out with your horse? Yeah, because it's a yeah. profound experience and, you know, like you, Emily, sitting under the tree, all the mm -hmm. nuance that starts to show up in the behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. So what I'm hearing as well is that in the herds, one of the things that you're seeing in these affiliate partnerships um, and relationships is healthy boundaries. Yeah. Am I wrong in saying that? No, that is absolutely like 100% there. And it is very, you now some of them, some of those boundaries are bigger than others. Like some of their zones are larger than others, but um, they, 
some of them are much more defined in what those are and others are you know they invite that space is smaller and they're very comfortable with that but everybody has their comfort levels and they're very defined on where those are. Um, the one, the differences I see are with horses that have been traumatized. I was going um, to just ask that. Yes. That. Um, that's, that's a whole different, that's a little bit different, but you know, giving them, giving them the chance to be around horses that are allowed to be horses for longer than they can relearn that, but it can vary a lot in terms of how long that takes. Right. Um, right. And, and their relationships, the, the horses at like the rescue place, how they choose to interact with me is also a little bit different than, um, than the mares at the breeding facilities. Um, they're a little bit more hesitant to want to engage with me in a physical way. They'll, they want to come up to me and they want to be in my space, but the mares, the, the breeding mares, they don't get, they get handled every day, but they don't, they were never ridden. They were never, you know, trained. Um, they were never, they didn't have that same history of all of these types of interactions that a lot of the equestrian community has. And they're a lot more curious and a lot, a lot more willing yeah. to sort of engage with me and, and have communication with me mm. where a lot of these ones that um, got rescued are a lot, they'll, they'll approach me, but it's, it's, they're not as willing to physically engage with me as, um, as the other ones are. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, do you notice anything in terms of their affiliate behavior? Those horses that have, you know, maybe had a traumatic past or, um, you know, what changes with, with the way they interact within the herd? Uh, I haven't gotten that far into the data yet, but just from observations, yeah. um, they don't have as strong boundaries. <laughs> As, Interesting. Um, um, and they also, but they do have, I mean, the rest of it's pretty much the same. Okay. Um, and it doesn't seem to vary. Now, I, I'm going to be, um, when I'm over in Scandinavia next week, I'll be looking at larger herds of geldings um, just to make sure, just to mm. see if I can't see any differences that are just, because I have just mares, then I have mixed genders, and I want to see if just geldings, you know, I have something different i mean i have lots of access to little herds of geldings but i wanted larger ones and so i'm um i'm gonna look at those too um and again this is just like i'm i, I just want to see if there's any differences and i'll get into their their histories and their backgrounds later to see if i can't see specific correlations yes um, yeah you did oh i'm sorry keep going oh no go ahead i was gonna say you mentioned something earlier about you know just spending time and yes. the importance of just time and proximity. And it's interesting. I've just, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of kind of towards the tail end of a study that I'm doing with people and my herd of horses. And I have about a dozen in my backyard and I send them out and I have, I'm, I have them, I have very specific interactions that I have them have with each horse. Mm. And so they go out and they come out eight, at least eight times and have the same exact interactions with the same exact horses so that the horses can create associations with those specific individuals. And, okay. and then, um, and then I, I look at how, how long the horses and the humans chose to spend with one another, the behavioral patterns of the horses. Cause I put cameras on the human's heads, yeah. the participants heads. So I'm looking at time spent with one another behaviors, um, you know, behaviors of, I can't see the human body position, but I can see what they're doing with their hands. And I can see how, you know, if they chose to approach the horse versus the horse choosing to approach them. Yep. And after all of this, and I interview the person and ask them about how they feel about each horse. And what's really interesting is that um, so far, it turns out that humans also really like just spending time <laughs> with horses, even if they don't get to touch them. So that's um, cool. Yeah, it's cool because we all think of, oh, I need to go out and I need to pet a horse and I need to touch. We're very touchy creatures. Humans yes. are very touch oriented. Oh, yes, yes. I, I often joke that Diva works on people's rejection wounds because she hates it when strangers touch her. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when someone's out in the field, like, come here, horsey. She's like, 
no, no. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, like we're, we're really touchy. Like, yes, totally. We like to be on each other and touch each other and cuddle, and horses don't do that. And so, no. Like, so some of these, in some of these instances, you know, in some of the pairings of my participant with a specific horse, it would just be just stand near that horse. Just don't, you're not allowed to touch them, just stand near them. And um, it was often those horses that the people felt most connected to. Very interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask about a bond. So they were they were actually feeling a bond. Yes. With that horse, even though they'd never touched them. Yes. Beautiful. And, um, and it was and it was those horses that seemed to want to approach the people more too, and rather than the ones that were maybe going out and t- trying to touch the the horse. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And that does make sense because I think. You know, from what I've seen, especially as a body worker, an equine body worker, um, there's horses that do not like being touched, mm-hmm. you know, at all. Um, you know, and some some really love it, but in specific ways. And listening is super important yes, in terms absolutely. of where they would like that touch and how they would like that touch to be mm-hmm. and how long <laughs> and yes. whether they can move away from that touch, like whether they have an opportunity, you know, to be released from that touch if necessary, like all of those things become really, really critical um, in that. And I think it's, I'm still learning that because it is very easy to go, okay, I need to get this stuff done, you know, I need to make these changes and I have to be able to, to touch you. Um, And I've actually found doing my, for certain horses, doing the energy work that I do, which requires no touching at all, is actually far more healing and profound for them than any sort of body work is. No, that's wonderful. Yeah. They love it. I mean, it, it always blows me away. They're out there like yawning and stretching and like having like all these blowing releases. I'm just like, Oh, like I'm like 20 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> right. So for them, like not the, the touch piece is not um, as critical. So that that all ties in so beautifully yeah yeah um so for those kinds of that kind of research with the people and your horses what were the certain sort of actions that you had the people doing um they again i had the i gave them they weren't i gave them the names of the horses what the horses looked like and the type of interaction they were allowed to have they had unlimited time they could go out there um they could approach the horse, the horse could approach them, but if the horse decided to end the um, interaction, they were not allowed to follow the horse. But yeah. the, um, the human was also allowed to end the interaction at any time as well. And if they felt like they wanted to continue with that horse, if the horse, after the horse left, they were allowed to come back to that horse later, but just not at that moment. And so um, they, I mean, my participants spent anywhere from half an hour to four hours Wow! Uh, out with them. And um, they were patting, scratching, stroking, or petting, I guess you could say, uh, or just standing next to the horse uh, were the four different ones that could be paired up with each horse. And obviously, you know, there's, you know, one horse out there who with participant one, the interaction would be petting, with participant two, it would be standing near. So it was, it varied depending on who the participant was. Mm-hmm. I, took, I took food out of the equation and we can certainly come back to that point, but food is an arousal mechanism that it creates excitement. Um, it uh, induces all kinds of other um, behavioral patterns that I wanted to take out of the equation for this yeah. particular um, experiment. I did another experiment uh, about two, a year and a half, two years ago that included touching and treats um and you know interesting results off of that one too but it was um but the the arousal behaviors that come off of treats i needed to take i needed to take that system offline and see if we could just deal with the um parasympathetic system or just um just the choice mechanisms without adding in the other um arousal systems so Mm -hmm. um so that's what I did, and um, and again, I have uh, I have a lot of data from that. I'm still collecting some, and um, it just I mean, every time I do something, it just brings up about 18 more questions that I need to have answered. 
<laughs> which yes. I love. Like, I love this work. I absolutely love it. And it just helps kind of piece together things to figure out what's, you know, how we can, how we can communicate better. And communication is two ways. Um, with yes, horses, it is. With horses and with actually most animals, we, it's been a one-way conversation for a very long time. It really, really has. It really has. So f from your research, I have a couple other questions that I want to ask, of course, mm -hmm. but from your research, what, what were some of the most successful ways that humans could sort of engage in the conversation, actually be part of the communication? It kind of gets back to what you were saying earlier about just listening. Okay, you try this just a little bit. Like, I, okay, let, let me come up to you. Let me see what your response is to when I just approach you, okay? And then how about if I touch you here just a little bit and then take it away? What do you want to do? And then, you know, the horse can, you know, maybe touch you back a little bit. That's, I mean, that's how they engage with one another when they decide to touch. It's they'll slowly approach, they'll get close. The one horse will just sort of nuzzle the other one just a tiny bit and wait for a response. And if the other one nuzzles the other one back, okay, well then let's do it a little bit harder next time and see if you want that again. And so it's a, it's learning to listen. And that learning to listen part takes time. This is very, I mean, there are very species specific things that horses do, but it's also very individualized. Um, as you were mentioning, there are some horses that don't like to be touched. There are some pairs of horses in the in the herds I'm looking at that don't touch each other. They just don't. That's not part of their relationship. Yep. And there are others that are, you know, I, some of these herds go and they're put under, they're brought in and put into these enclosed areas for a really brief amounts of time so they can figure out which ones need to be um, palpated that day. And then, yep. they're all put, then they're all put back. But in these confined areas, it's a slightly more stressful situation. And so you'll see them grooming more. And that, right. that mutual grooming doesn't, it, it happens more often and it definitely happens. So it happens more frequently in general, but pretty much just the same ones will do it with each other rather than all of them, all of a sudden grooming one another. Some yep. horses don't groom each other. Yeah. And, okay. and that listening part and creating that opportunity to listen, engage and allowing for that, um, understanding of our horse's behavior when we're engaging with them. And I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, I come, I come from that typical equestrian background of, you know, you, you go and you tie your horse up and you groom your horse as quickly as possible to get all the dirt off so you can mm -hmm. saddle. Um, and then, okay, you're riding around the arena, the horse is tossing its head. Okay. Then you either smack your horse or you yank on the bit or God knows what. I don't get know. another piece of equipment. Yes. <laughs> Add something else in there. Get a tie down. Get another <laughs> band, a crank band on there. Stop okay. that behavior. Yes, exactly. And instead uh -huh. of, instead of, and, and we have so much equipment to stop horses from. Oh, behaving. yeah. Yes, we uh -huh. do. Yeah. And, um, and if, but if we engage in that process of listening, then we're going to create a better relationship because not only are we listening and responding more appropriately, but our horses then have the opportunity to be in a relationship where they're heard. Yeah. Yes. And, and with the people that you chatted with and did your research with, did you find any of them? You know, I think with humans, one of the traps that we fall into is around projection and around, mm -hmm. you know, this is the thing that I want. This is the thing that I deem a, you know, sort of a, a value that I need to, or a, a, a box that I need to check to be, to make this successful. Did you find that those people were kind of able to step out of that, <laughs> no, out of that see. place? <laughs> the, the ones in my study who have horse experience, oh my God, it was so hard for them to go oh, out there and be, I bet. They, all they wanted to do was like, oh, I want to go out and just pet or catch the horse. Or what am I supposed to be doing? And I, I got to like, do something. Yes, right? exactly. They feel doing part. Um, and then it was really interesting is because, you know, they go out there and they're told to, you know, these are the interactions they have with these horses. And okay, so the horse is eating while they're doing this. And most of them have expressed this idea that this horse is you know, disinterested or they're yep. rejecting or, but what's fascinating is that 
really that's what horses do with one another is they yeah. share that space while they're because they graze most of the day and so part of that is sharing that space while they're eating and um and so that that interpretation of oh this horse isn't changing its behavior because i'm out there just that in itself can be an amazing thing mm -hmm. and that the horse doesn't move or doesn't walk away or doesn't do something that's just as powerful and meaningful as when they do absolutely especially when they have full choice around it exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and and i think you know so often yeah we do project those things like you know this is a rejection or they're not listening yeah. or they're being disrespectful yes. or, you know, that's a really big one. I think that drives our training behavior is, mm -hmm. oh, they're being disrespectful. I need to, you know, make a change here. So they, they respect what I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm laughing you know that one. Like respect. Um, yeah. It's, right. Yeah. Like how do we define respect and what does that really mean? It doesn't um, mean anything in horse no. language. No. <laughs> no. Well, honestly, in, in maybe in horse language, again, as far as I know, that respect is that I tell you something and you listen. And uh -huh. if I'm telling you I don't like this, then you're going to respect that and not continue to do it. And yet what do we do is we have a tendency to punish that behavior instead. Um, wow, that is an irony unto itself right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, and it's a, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's just a very, it's a very interesting kind of space because, you know, we have, again, I, I grew up in that world where here's all the ways that we're supposed to be interpreting horse behavior. And like you said, oh, the horse is acting up. He's not respecting me. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to find connection by running him around a round pen. Yes, when make really it happen. All yeah, like, you know, when we go into a round pen with our horses, you know, we're basically driving our horses away from us and giving them to nowhere to go. So yes. here we are in the middle of this round space and we're like, if okay, so if we were to go out into the pasture, for example, and do that same thing, the horse will just run away from us. And Oh yeah, they'd be gone. Exactly, yeah, that's what we're asking them to do, except we're not giving them anywhere to go. And, and then, and we're interpreting that as some form of building a, a respectful communication yeah so very yeah. It's, it's a very again and i grew up with that so i understand but again learning this from like seeing this better from the equine ethology perspective it's a whole different world of what that really looks like for the horse big time so so tell us a little bit about because i know kind of what my transition looked like and it's been very messy and very long from that kind of get it done side of things mm -hmm. to you know going through the pirelli thing to you know like i've, I've gone through my various phases i call it <laughs> <laughs> of horsemanship of going what the heck am i doing um and then kind of you know, waking up, what, what, what's your process been in, <laughs> you know, in a nutshell oh, from growing oh, up, oh, growing yeah. up with, you know, in the way that you did, you know, kind of what were your stepping stones? What, what, what made the shift? Was there a particular kind of moment or was it a lot of moments? Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. No, it was actually a very specific one. Um, so I grew up, um, fox hunting. So I did um, oh, wow. um, a lot of cross country and I eventually, you know, I was trained in, I was trained in hunter jumper and dressage, but I didn't, I didn't do much competition. I had a little bit of dressage competition, but it was more, um, uh, I had a lot of trainers in various different ways. And, um, and eventually did a lot of training. I, I trained and I taught myself and again, not so much for competition, more so because I found that people got a lot out of being around horses um and i couldn't really pinpoint why but i wanted to be part of it so so i took and i would continue to to learn and stuff and and again and then uh and i went to god knows how many different kinds of clinics and workshops with everybody from uh god ray hunt to mm -hmm. clinton anderson and um i never went to a pirelli one but uh but all the big names monty roberts john mayans like and 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 you know your typical you know, Olympic dressage rider, yeah. like everything, everything in between. And again, I found a ton of inconsistencies. And again, when I got back in, when I got into equine assisted psychotherapy, 
I found even more inconsistencies because there's no standardized education nope, there for, what, for what equine professionals need to know in that field. And then, and so I wanted to find, okay, what's the, there's got to be research here. There's got to be science. And so I, I um, enrolled at uh, the University of Edinburgh in their equine science program, um, in their uh, graduate program. And sometime during, I think it was the equitation science class, uh, whatever it was, I was, I started to learn about learning theory and uh, equine learning theory and how that applied to equitation. And, and I was starting to overlap that with what I knew of for research for relationships. And it just hit me so hard that none of how we interact with horses is it all aligned with how we may have relationships and and i literally like i could i grew up going into the pasture having to chase down my horse yep totally if the horse, if the horse didn't want to be caught well once you catch it you lunge that horse until its legs fall off basically yeah and then um and so i walked into the pasture one day and half of the horses walked away from me and I'm thinking, okay, this was normal growing up. And all of a sudden it hit me. Why? Like, why would the horses want to walk away from me? What, what relationship have I established with these horses that means that they don't want to come to me? Yeah. And so that's when I started looking at all the equipment and all the ways that I'd been taught and all the things I'd been taught. And I was thinking, I'm like, if all these wonderful horsemen people trainers that I've worked under were right well then these horses should be enjoying what I'm doing with them and they're not no so um so I literally didn't touch the horses for about a month and a half Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't know what to do it was like all of all of the stuff that I'd learned all of a sudden got into a whole new realm and I was like I don't have this I don't have the right tools to do what I want and then um so instead um I decided that, okay, if this is a relationship I've established with them where I walk into the pasture and they walk away from me, well, then I need to start establishing a new relationship that's going to hopefully end up where they do want to come to me. And so we're going to trial that out, see what that looks like and see if I can make that happen. And so instead of haltering them, pulling them out, tying them up, grooming them up, whatever I was doing, um, I would, I went in and I would pull them out and we'd go into the arena and we would just um, explore things together. I'd give them, I'd give them a problem solving kind of thing Mm -hmm. where they got to knock things over. And, um, and it was great. It was this great, like mutual exploration thing that we just, we all got, I I got into. And then, and then it became this, I would go into the, and I would go hang out with them. I would just go spend time with them. And, um, and I would just literally sit in the hay bale and just, or sit on the ground and just be with them. And so that's kind of the shift. I don't ride much anymore. Um, I do engage with my horses in different ways, especially in their space and giving them the opportunity to choose to do so. Um, Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I I would love to ask you this question then, because I know in a lot of the equine industry, I hear this all the time. Uh, We have, you know, two horses here at the barns with three horses. I ride diva a little bit, um, not, not a ton and generally only bareback and kind of, it's very, it's very chill bit list. Um, but the other two horses aren't ridden. And I find a lot of people are like that, you know, horses are, horses are supposed to be ridden. (laughs) Why aren't you riding these horses? You know, what's wrong with them? And I'm like, (laughs) they're actually like real content. I mean, they like, look at them. They got tons of food. They have lots of interaction. There's lots of different spaces. They're not bored. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they got lots to do. Um, so, so what is your response when someone's like, yeah, horses, you, you have to ride them. <laughs> it's funny. Cause I, I, um, yeah, it's, I, I, that's exactly the conversation I've had with people. And I always, I, I, I ask people, I say, well, why do you have a dog? Like a lot of people have dogs. Why do you have a dog? Like, what do you do with your dog? Yeah. Everybody, everybody always says, oh, you have horses. Okay, what do you do with your horse? As if it always has to be an activity process. But if somebody says, oh, I have a dog, nobody ever says, what do you do with your dog? It's your dog. Totally. It's your companion. And so, okay, what do I do with my horses? Well, 
if I if I had to name an activity, I'd go stand with them, but that's not really that's for anybody to watch. Um, it's, yeah, they're probably depends on where you live. They can certainly be a much more expensive companion. I was gonna um, say, yeah, there's that for sure. Um, so there there seems to be this need to justify that. Um, arguably writing and having an activity makes it even more expensive if you were going to look at the financial component of that. Very much so. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we all, it's funny because again, it's kind of based on our history. We, we, we bred dogs for companionship. We, we did breed them to work, but where they live with us, they spend a ton of time with us like yes. all day. Horses, we pretty much treated them like cars. I mean, we stick them in stalls and we brought them out when we needed them and stuck them back when we didn't. Yep. And, and so we only interacted with them when it, we needed them for something. And so this idea of shifting that to, oh, wait, we can just be with our horses and not have an agenda? Like that's a kind of a foreign concept to a large number of people. A large number of people, yes, yes. And I hope becoming less, you know, um, cause I've heard this where people are like, well, I'm terrified to ride, so I can't get a horse. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, why not? Like, yeah, just have one hanging out, like, you know, or a couple, like they're, they're, you know, they can, they can be there without having this, this sense that they need to be ridden. Um, and so I, I really, you know, hope that, 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 can kind of get busted up because I know there's a lot of horses out there that are just not wanting to be ridden at all, you know? Oh my gosh, yes. Oh, <laughs> that, and that's exactly, I mean, this, this brings up a whole other aspect of, you know, improving equine welfare because yeah. there's a ton of horses that can't be ridden. Totally. Shouldn't be ridden shouldn't or don't be ridden. a lot that don't want to be ridden. Um, Absolutely. There's other amazing ways that they can have relationships with us or with other animals. Um, but, but yeah, finding, finding opportunities for these other horses that can improve their welfare and ours uh, at the same time. And I think that there's a huge space there that, is, that needs to be examined. Very much so. Is that knowing how much value those horses add to someone, you know, in relational space to mm -hmm. a human, to a human life. There's so much learning. There's so much growth. There's, there's so much, you know, possibility there. I, I yeah, it, I, I really hope that that can shift for, pe for people, that mindset of like, you know, they have to be ridden. This is the only way it's like, well, you know, there's a lot of horses that are dealing with you know, lameness issues or mm -hmm. congenital issues or, you know, things that are going on that don't, allow their bodies or their minds to support us doing this pretty intense thing for them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that one of the things I like to bring in is I always ask Diva permission to ride. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know? uh, do I have, yeah. It's um, the whole idea of, uh, of asking our horses if they want to be a part of this. Yeah. If they want, I mean, I do have, I, you know, there are the dozen horses that are in, in my backyard. I would argue that there are two or three that actually enjoy going out and exploring, but I don't think it has anything to do with being ridden. I think it has to do with yes. going out and exploring and having a good time. Uh, it just happens to be that someone's sitting on their back and hopefully not creating too much problems up there. And whether it's me or someone else. So yes. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I've found with Diva, sometimes it's like, yeah, we do, I like to do this because then we get a chance to connect. And, and yes. you know, that, that it's an, another opportunity to connect, you know, yeah. and she goes, well, I'll do this for you. But for years, she's been like, you know, mom, can, can I retire? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, if we just do a little bit, you know, I, I'm yeah. sure I will just have to be like, okay, we're done. But, um, you know, she's, she's very good hearted and good natured about it. Um, you know, and, uh, but yeah, it's like, I think if many horses had the choice that, um, yeah, they, they would do other things. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we can't interact with them. It just means that, okay, riding may not be the, what they want to be doing. So I mean, some of them I think would be very happy just going on a walk. 
And, oh, yeah. Um, without, without the saddle, you know, obviously a halter is helpful, but I mean, even then, if you, if you have the space, like do you see if they'll want to go without one. Yeah. And, um, and again, just like, I'm a huge advocate of taking stuff out into the pasture and like, oh, look, I found this fun ball. Let's see what we can, like, we'll, we'll explore it together or, love that. Um, or set up. I mean, I have a lot of standards and poles and blocks and things and just sort of setting up new things that, oh, it's totally fine if they want to knock it over and do whatever they want with it. That's yeah. great. Let's, let's do this together. And um, part of what I'm trying to do is look into... I'm looking into the uh, all the science and research and you know friendships, relationships, um, and what that means. Breaking it down into a components from the human perspective, and then overlapping that with what is out there and what we're learning about from the horse perspective. So where are the overlapping ethologies, mm. and how can we exploit that better to benefit both species, especially if there's an activity involved, but also if there's not? Like where are the overlaps to really, really get at what we're yeah. looking for? And what have you found so far? Um, relationships is kind of very basic. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, trust. If you look at trust, for example, it's time and proximity with consistent, safe space. And that can be very, that varies in terms of how long that takes to build trust based on the individual and, of course, the species, but mostly the individual. Um, and so once trust is established, then, only then, can we really start to incorporate just slightly uncertain, I would, I would say, I mean, technically it's a stress, it's a stressor, you're introducing a stressor, but I'm not talking about like you're going to blow a bomb up somewhere. This is, um, it's uncertainty. So that includes curiosity. It includes um, just a slight uncertainty, but you're doing it together. It's a together partnership exploring something or it's solving a problem together where it's not unsafe it's still safe the outcome is slightly unpredictable simply because we're not sure what the outcome is but it's not so unpredictable as to potentially be dangerous mm. so it's the same idea of you get into a car wreck versus a roller coaster your body's going through the same things but on a roller coaster, you have all this safety equipment and you have no, you have pretty much guarantee, oh, I'm not going to die. This is not because I'm going to die, but it's exciting. Yes. Right. You have that versus being in a car accident where, yeah, if it's a bad car accident, yes, there could be potential huge consequences. And so it's a whole different sort of idea of, okay, this is a safe versus an unsafe outcome. And so it's kind of like play. Play is the same. Play can look like fighting, mm -hmm. but play has that predictability to it because you're engaged with someone with whom you've established trust yep. and safe proximity over time. And so yep. the problems come in is when, you know, again, we look at equitation and all the tools we have, we have this idea, like you said earlier, we go out and we have this agenda, we have this activity. And that activity is again, based on that negative reinforcement, that pressure and release, that aversive stimulus that we give to horses, that's a stressor. We haven't earned the right to incorporate that stressor yet. If we're trying to establish a relationship, we haven't gotten to that point yet. So that spending that time, that creating that safe space, that creating that predictable, safe, consistent environment to establish appropriate levels of trust between horse and human mm. is an essential part before we can really incorporate those other things um, yeah. if we're really trying to get at that relationship. And then we can start building on that. And again, we have... We can do those little stressors, again, safe outcomes all the time. And then, you know, provided everything goes well, then we can grow that. Yes. And, um, and do that even more. And, 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 and it seems to be the same way so far with horses as it is with people. Um, but we really need to kind of look at how that manifests over time, especially between horses and people to see, mm. you know, to make sure that's that is what's going on but so far all yes. of the data looks like it's in that direction Points to that direction that's beautiful and you're adding so much value into the relationship uh, mm -hmm. which is you know helping that horse be you know find trust and safety you know in absolutely a human world so yeah yeah that's <laughs> yeah. amazing oh my god i want to keep talking to you 
forever here. I'm like, um, <laughs> we're kind of, we're nearing our, the end of our time, which is so sad. Uh, so we'll definitely have to do this again if you're agreeable oh, to my, it. Well, this is great. I, I, I warned you I might talk a lot. So I'm really this. So I love you. it. I love it. And I hope uh, everyone out there listening is enjoying it as much as we are. Um, and so, Emily, just before we close today, I would love to, you know, if you have any, do you have any resources that you really love, like books or videos or teachers or like anything that kind of inspired, has inspired you or kind of brought you along on this journey uh, anywhere that people can kind of go for, for more information on this work that you're doing? Um, well, I, I'm currently working at, um, I, I work with Mimer Center, which is a, a Swedish nonprofit. That's M I M E R. Oh, I've um, seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Center and center is spelled the European way with the R E um, dot org. So I, I do work with them. Um, we do education and, um, research with them. Uh, again, I'm finishing up my work here at uh, Oklahoma State and hopefully creating a research center here. We're working on creating that too. Um, nice. in, in terms of my um, like, you know, resources that I can tell people, it's a shame because there's really not yep. any solid place for people to go right now. There's a lot of little resources, lots of people. And I think that just opening up, just continue. It took me years. I thought I was in this alone. I, I honestly yeah. thought I was in this all alone. And then all of a sudden I met one person and that one person knew another person and that person knew five people. And it became this, and literally this was last year. That I got, like, oh my goodness. Um, that opened up. And I was like, Oh my God, thank God. There's more yes, people. Thank totally. God, wonderful. This is great. And so I would, I mean, obviously by listening to your podcast, they're already on the right track of whatever they're looking for. Um, and this is no, the, and, and you obviously provide an amazing resource for people too. So this is fantastic. Aww. I'm so glad you're doing this. <laughs> well, make me all teary. <laughs> <laughs> but it is because the more people have access to what they're looking for, the better off they're going to be in finding it. And Absolutely. so thank you for doing this because Aww. this is, this is an important part of that. Yeah, well, it's definitely my heart's work too. And, you know, I think for those of us that love horses, and I think all of us do that are listening, it's like we're, we want to we wanna find the way. And sometimes like you, where you're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> what do I do instead? <laughs> you know, um, that this is, you know, opening up some possibilities there. And that the work that you're doing is opening up some possibilities. Um, it sounds like so many, which I'm, I'm also so grateful for. And um, Definitely, we will meet again. Oh, um, I hope so. And um, have a wonderful time in Europe. And <laughs> yeah, you. yeah. And, and thanks to everyone for, for tuning in and taking time out today. Uh, we hope that you uh, are taking something away of value. And um, yeah, yeah. We look forward to seeing you again soon. I look forward to, you know, what's up next. Uh, so we will see you all very, very soon. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for having me. You're so welcome, Emily. It was a pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure is all mine. All right, everybody. Bye for now.